This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, so yes, I'm going to talk about uh, one of our most uh, favorite uh, plant types today. And uh, as I go through this, what I'm going to try and get you to do is to think. And, and I, I'm going to uh, put some things on here that basically might change your thinking, might solidify your thinking, uh, but I want you to, to think more broadly about weeds because I think a lot of this has to do with some of our preconceived ideas and, and maybe some of the things that we've learned over time. Um, but I will just get into this. And um, this might be familiar to some of you, uh, not sure, but um, you know, this guy out here, he's, he's not real old. Uh, he's, he's laying down on the job, but you can see he's, he's quite frustrated. And, uh, you know, asking him about this new frontier, well, are you kidding me? This is no new frontier. This is the same old thing that I've been doing, uh, you know, for the past few years of my life. So, our attitude towards weeds. Now, I've, I've put this into, I'm, I'm just giving broad terms to conventional thinking and sustainable thinking. Now, these are not good or bad. This is just how we sometimes tend to think. So in conventional type systems, you know, typically you want 100% weed free. Uh, we know that they negatively compete with uh, available resources. So eliminating weeds is, is number one priority. And there's obviously there's a relationship with economic uh, losses associated with those systems. In more sustainable systems or sustainable thinking, uh, you know, often it's, it's density thresholds. How many weeds are out there can I, can I get by with and are they really having a, uh, an impact that I need to work with? Uh, also plant diversity. So the thinking more broadly, you know, there's, these are plants. They're adding diversity to the system. And also are they providing an alternative cover, whether it's a mulch, whether it's, you know, something else that allows these um, allows them to um, remain in these systems. But the impacts of weeds um, and through the literature, uh, various studies, good or bad, okay? And this is somewhat conflicting. And again, it's based on kind of your thinking and, 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 and what you're kind of geared toward. But we can think of weeds as either they compete for resources or they contribute to resources through you know, biomass um, or, or, or competing for available resources. They inhibit or assist operations, whether that's harvest, you know, uh, clogging up your harvester or, or you know, providing a mulch. Um, harbor insects and diseases or support beneficials. Uh, increase uh, agronomic biodiversity, but maybe lower uh, diversity in our natural systems where you see invasive plants becoming monocultures. Uh, there's kind of, you know, this diver biodiversity issue. And then also increased production costs, uh, or are we increasing the environmental benefits? If you think of a, a weed as a plant that has some um, uh, desirable characteristics. So this is a bit of a conflict, um, and I don't think it's been resolved completely. But if we look back, so historically, if we're looking back because we want to know what, what have we gone through, what have we worked on. So weed is defined as a plant out of place. I think most of you have heard that definition. But uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson is, is defined as a plant whose virtues have not yet been discovered. So instead of looking at the glass as half empty, he's looking at it as half full. So over time, now I've, I've put this, um, this time scale uh, back <coughs> in the early days all the way up to here. And you can see that, and this is basically relating to weeds, um, you know, whether we had the first hand implements, then we get into horse-drawn, um, uh, mechanical, uh, the chemical era begins with uh, the first herbicide or the uh, 2,4-D herbicide. Um, some, you know, internet was invented in 1973. Okay, why is that important to weeds? Well, I'll get into that as far as technology. Um, we have the first herbicide resistant ryegrass, resistant to, to um, uh, seven sites of actions. So if you're familiar with the herbicide resistance uh, scenario or, or issue, 
there's, there's different sites of actions with the different modes of actions. And this ryegrass here is, is, is pretty major. Uh, and this occurred in 1982. Uh, if we look at certified organic systems, uh, was certified in the US in 1990. Uh, the executive order, and everyone's familiar with the, the Clinton era when they uh, de declared invasive species as uh, something that we need to start managing, or they made it an executive order. And now we have climate hubs developed in 2013. And uh, the most recent research that I've seen is the development of an automated weeder by some folks at UC Davis. So these are kind of some of the events that contribute to uh, what I'm going to talk about. Um, but in addition to those changes, we've also had you know, ecological, the theory has, has advanced over that same time period. And we've also seen some practical application in our management. So that's changed whether we're talking about hand implements all the way up to an automated weeder, okay? So we're seeing a lot of changes over time that I think also contribute to our, our viewpoint and our thinking. But weeds and ecosystems, they're either resilient or they're pesky. And this is based on kind of perception, but in, in these natural ecosystems, semi-natural or urban ecosystems, Weeds tend to be survivors. They tend to persist. Um, they're very prolific in, in either producing seed or producing biomass. And in some ways, you could view them as opportunistic. Uh, they look for niches, and I, I'm giving them kind of human qualities, but niches are what they take advantage of. And, and that's really what we see, especially when you look at a lot of these um, in our managed systems, there's a lot of disturbance going on there. So there's opportunities that are created for weeds. So I'm going to talk about kind of three main areas. And this is related to the things that I uh, have done research on or what my interests were uh, prior to coming here. Um, and I'm going to just talk about these three things uh, just to get us thinking about uh, more broadly as far as weeds and invasive plants. So super weeds. Now, Super weeds is a very, um, it kind of uh, gets your attention, whether it's at the emotional level or, or whatever. You've probably seen it in the popular press. Um, associated with uh, genetically modified crops. Um, so this article by, um, uh, by uh, Kogan in, in 2005 talked about super weeds are impossible to kill. Well, they're impossible to kill if you're using one herbicide and if it's glyphosate, you're going to have a glyphosate resistant um, uh, gene that's either transferred uh, to uh, the weed or uh, the indiscriminate spraying of glyphosate onto resistant GM crops. You're basically uh, providing selection pressure to uh, allow for a resistant weedy plant. Okay, so herbicide resistant. Are they really super weeds? Well, we've, you probably ought to, you, maybe you've seen this graph, but this is from Ian Heap and his Weed Science um, website. Basically, we've seen a <coughs> dramatic increase in uh, herbicide resistant weeds. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Palmer amaranth in the south uh, in cotton fields has been a huge uh, issue for them uh, to deal with. And it's actually forced uh, some growers to even go out of. Uh, growing cotton. But it's a nice, you know, poster child of herbicide resistant weeds. Again, these characteristics uh, contribute to its success in these uh, cropping systems. So I'm going to take you through a, a time lapse, if you will. In 1989, the first uh, Palmer amaranth uh, resistance was identified in um, <laughs> Tennessee and Georgia, if my geography is correct. So South Carolina, thank you. We'll get to Georgia. So 1990, 91, 93, 94, 95, 97, 98, 2000. And I'm just going to go right ahead. And just you can see that continually we're seeing these plants. 2012, and the, again, this is uh, from the uh, herbicide resistance uh, website, but you can see that in each of these states, at least one individual or one population has been identified resistance to herbicide. So is, what, is it what's going to happen you know, onwards? Is there going to be just uniform resistance? 
Um, we hope not. But I'm going to shift gears. So there's the resistance issue, but also um, in my work, I was especially interested in extreme events. And what we're seeing, in, especially in the Midwest, was significant drought and significant um, impacts of drought on cropping systems. And so there's been a lot of work. There still is a lot of work on developing drought tolerant crops, corn, soybeans, things like that. Um, but for as much, for what I know, there's not a real interest or there's not a lot of work in drought tolerant weeds or invasive plants. Now I know Tony has uh, uh, written some things and there's some folks that are working on it, but as far as the real um, focused effort, um, it's not, it's not a lot of work has been done on that. But just to kind of define it, it's a, de a delay in lethal dehydration. Usually it's related to the physiology or morpho morphology of the plant. And uh, we see a phenotypic plasticity where the plant either uses less water, it loses less water, or it gains access to water through root uh, penetration through the ground. And then there's also the genetic adaptation where over time, if there's, it's, it's another selection pressure that um, is, is creating um, a change in the population. And this depends a lot on the intensity and duration of that selection pressure. So as I indicated, um, in 2012, we saw this chart uh, from the US Drought Monitor. And this central part of the country was either red or brown for most of the year. And so I looked at uh, Phragmites australis, which I think you folks have some of that out here, uh, either good or bad. Um, but looking at Phragmites common reed and its tolerance to drought. So we looked, we had a greenhouse study we set up. Basically we had these uh, large tanks where we um, uh, transplanted uh, Phragmites and then we submitted or um, uh, exposed them to different uh, stress periods. And this we had a low stress, medium stress, and severe stress. And basically that was uh, related to the number of days that there was no water in those uh, mesocosms. And so for our lowest stress, we had 19 days of no water, which in addition, there were four days where it was at greater than 80% available water was depleted. So we're getting down to very, very dry conditions essentially. And so our medium stress was 36 days with no water, 20 days at, at greater than 80%. And then our severe st uh, stress, basically a month of, of no water. And out of, those, out of that 60 days, there were about 44 days where it was uh, significantly dry. So what did we see? Um, in our lowest stress treatment, where we had uh, seven, this is day 70. So on, on day 70, we added water back into those tanks. And you know, looking at this, it, we, you'd say, well, that plant is either dead or it has gone dormant. Well, it was actually dormant because 25 days post-drought, it had started to green up. Now, this is just the low stress. I was convinced that the severe stress, we'd killed those plants. I thought, they're dead, absolutely. Well, not the case because 25 days later, those plants were starting to green up. And you can ask, well, did you get all the water out of that soil? We had soil moisture sensors that were basically reading zero. And I know there's, you know, there's probably could have been pockets of, of water in those systems. But um, very much an indication that this plant is, is very tolerant to drought conditions. And maybe some of you are, are familiar with that or have worked on this particular species. Um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, Carduus nutans, which is must thistle. Uh, we looked at inv an invasion study uh, into cool and warm season perennial grasses, and we had simulated grazing for two years. Uh, and we also introduced musk thistle in the first year, in the spring of the first year. And part of this study was very interesting in, in that we had normal precipitation one year, and then we went into our drought year in 2012, which was um, the, the worst drought that they've had on record. So it was really nice for our study. It was horrible for people that were, you know, cropping and, and, and that part. Uh, but it worked out really well for us to, to compare that. So I'm just going to go right to the results. Um, and then again, along the, um, 
the x-axis here is the, the, the dates, so April 2011 all the way up to November 2012. And then here's our volumetric water content. Uh, these represent the, the various treatments, whether it was bare ground, must the soil by itself, warm season grazed, warm season non-grazed, cool season grazed, cool season non-grazed. But basically this shows you that in the second year where we had our um, uh, must, and I realize these lines are not really easy for you to see, but where there was not basically non-grazing, so our non-grazed treatments, um, we had, th there was water content, but where we had our must thistle and, in, and anything where there was grazing, if I'm reading that right, uh, had depleted water down. So we saw a difference in water content between these two treatments. And this is a really great graph, especially if you're um, tired and, and you want to uh, go to sleep really easily. Um, and and uh, pardon me for the, uh, the, the busyness, but along here, the X -axis, these are all our treatments. Uh, and this is basically looking at light penetration into the canopy over May, June, July, and August of 2011, and then the same thing in 2012. So, so what I want to highlight is at the initial part of our study, we had um, good plant cover. So if you think, so if you see a high bar, that means um, there's uh, a lot of uh, light uh, penetrating into the, uh, to the soil surface. If you see uh, bars that are low, that means there's not a lot of light reaching the soil surface. So looking at, and I'm just going to point out a couple, these two treatments are warm season non-grazed must thistle, where we added it, and warm season um, uh, where we just added uh, must thistle by itself. Or, sorry, warm season non-grazed without must thistle. So you can see in 2011, it's doing a good job at shading out the uh, soil surface. But in 2012, and now these are perennial grasses. They should be growing robustly, you know, uh, providing some good shade. In 2012, the drought was affecting um, these grasses where they had now were allowing uh, light to penetrate the soil surface. And you say, well, why is that important? Well, for musk thistle, it's very important. And once it gets access to light with enough soil moisture, it grows very well. Again, here's the same thing. This is just looking at populations over time. So in 2011, 2012, I'm just highlighting this, our warm season, non-grazed, where we introduced musk thistle. So you can see here, early on, it started to establish, but then in August, it disappeared. Same thing in 2012, it started to establish. By July, those plants were dead. So what was going on? In 2011, we had great soil moisture, we had normal precipitation, uh, we had very nice establishment of musk thistle in our grazed treatments. In our non-grazed plots in 2012, this is basically musk thistle emerging and then it would die without produ producing a flower or any kind of uh, seed head. And just for comparison, here's our uh, beautiful bare ground plots of musk thistle, which we did get a lot of attention by people driving, but this is right by a highway, and they would drive by and say, you need to control that. It was, you know, because it's a noxious weed, and we were trying to uh, uh, do research on it. We, we were, we were, um, we bagged all the, the seed heads, so just to let you know, we didn't let all the seed g just go everywhere. We were, we were bagging the seed heads, and then the second year, we, we uh, chopped all this down, and I, I did actually get a chance to operate a, sh a shovel and uh, take care of any uh, remaining. So, um, but this is just to, just a little bit of an, uh, kind of an introduction of, of where we're seeing this um, uh, tolerance or not tolerating uh, these dry drought conditions. So, uh, does tolerant or resistance make it super? Well, we also know that there's, there's weeds that are tolerant to mowing they're tolerant to, to disking or disturbances. It's really dependent on intensity and duration. And it's not super, but they're actually resilient. So phenologically or genetically, it adapts to environmental stress, whether you know, an example is drought. Uh, it, these plants are able to e evolve um, as far as their defense mechanisms. Uh, you know, and this is a, an example of herbicides. 
and they're also able to access spatial temporal resources, whether that's light, water, or nutrients. Now, I, I'm saying this related to weeds, but again, they're just plants. They're not, you know, some form formidable uh, foe that is that is that we can't really deal with, and I'll talk about that a at the end as well. So bioenergy, uh, we're going to shift gears here a little bit. Bioenergy research. Uh, this is just a map of of where some of the regional um, uh, uh, projects have been uh, conducted across the country. And this is a little bit dated. It's not uh, really up to date. Um, but just to show you, and I think everyone is aware of, of the bioenergy research that's going on, there's several resources. There's several um, things that folks are looking at. Obviously, corn, corn residue, uh, switchgrass, perennial grasses. Uh, there's been some interest in Miscanthus uh, gigantis. Biodiesel, soybeans, canola, camilla, camelina, and others. Um, I just want to point out there's uh, even within this group, there's folks uh, looking at um, grass bioenergy. But there's also been some interest in uh, invasive plants as uh, bioenergy sources. And if you look at these three photos, the thing, or sorry, four, my math is not working real well. Um, you can see that there's high amounts of biomass, right? That's, that's the big interest is how can we create a lot of biomass to you know, create ethanol and, and provide some fuel? Well, like we discussed for Palmer, uh, invasive plants have some similar characteristics. They're fast growing, high biomass, relatively few pests. They create these dense monocultures, and there's few inputs to kind of keep them going. But on the flip side of that, they, that is a great scenario for invasion. And there's, there's a lot of potential with these plants. Some, have already, you know, some have already, are already doing their invasive work. The weed risk assessments, is it anyone familiar? Are you familiar with weed risk assessments? So assessing a plant for its, um, its uh, invasive or its uh, ability to become a, a problem. Um, most of these assessments on these plants are positive. They're, it's, they're highly um, problematic, or they could be highly problematic. Peer-reviewed position papers, uh, these are just two of many papers that have opposed uh, this kind of a, you know, use of these invasive plants, as well as public land managers. I mean, when you say, hey, guess what? We're going to use these for bioenergy. They say, are you crazy? Uh, because it's, it's, a, it's a thing that we're always managing and then somehow you want to protect that uh, to create a, a fuel source. Well, a, a new approach, I think, is, is important here. And this gets back to what, how do we think about this? And if we're harvesting existing populations and the focus is on control and restoration, I think it's a little bit different uh, scenario. And also, if we can uh, commingle these uh, sources with other resources, uh, you address the sustainability issue. So there's a paper in uh, Frontiers in, uh, in 2013. They basically looked at bioenergy that supports ecological restoration. And they were focused on these two uh, invasive plants, Russian olive and tamarisk, in Washington state. They had a 52-acre restoration site. And this was, this was all uh, modeled. They did this by modeling, so there wasn't actual you know, it wasn't an actual field study. But they looked at, you know, all the, the available tamarisk Russian olive, kind of assessed the biomass, and found out that, um, you know, there's, there was a significant amount that could be produced per year, and they estimated for decades. So they compared their data to national estimates, and basically what they came up with was that they said we could ex they could expand restoration activities and biomass supplies which would then uh, um, create revenue. Um, well, so it would be supported by revenues from the uh, sale of the invasive uh, tree wood waste. So basically, you're supporting that, that, that restoration effort by the sale of the uh, invasive plant biomass. So you're, you're trying to create this uh, system that supports itself. So I'd seen that. I'd already been thinking about this. and. 
I, I've submitted numerous proposals uh, with other colleagues, uh, different disciplines. Uh, you know, just an example of some of the proposals we submitted. We've submitted to numerous uh, funding sources, requesting up to fifteen million dollars with zero uh, funded. So, if anyone is interested in this, if you want to pursue this, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, but just realize what you're up against, and um, then and and I'm going to show you some of the barriers of why. Okay, so it's an ideological. You know, how are we thinking about this? There's environmental risk. We already know that there's a weed risk. And even if you're transporting this stuff, there's potential that, okay, you could distribute it you know, in, the, in the pathway somewhere. Economical, I've, I've run into this over and over. You know, these plants are not sustainable. If we harvested everything, there wouldn't be enough to, to supply the energy needs that we're looking at. You know, so it's not a particularly energy dense material. Um, there's social issues conflicting of national agendas so the Department of Energy says hey grow this stuff yet the USDA says no we need to control it so um, you know you can't it's hard to go to them and, and propose something when there's not really agreement between agencies so we're, we're, we're going through all this we're having this really good discussion and meanwhile the invasive plants continue to spread because they don't really care what we think Okay, so, but this is just uh, some ideas that, that I've been thinking about and, and working on uh, in when I was my previ lo previous location. So the last thing I want to talk about is automation. And just to, to preface that, so in, in agriculture, I uh, looked at you know, some of the trends that are occurring. And we've, look, we've seen that uh, land use in ag has dropped from 54 to 51%. So that's you know, kind of holding steady. Uh, labor declined 30%. Um, while agricultural produ productivity increased 50%, larger farms, 97% family owned. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm not going to question. I mean, this is a, a report by the USDA. But the thing I want to really point out here is the increased adoption of new technologies. And that's really what we're seeing in some of our cropping systems. But in addition to that, we're kind of, we've, we've got these challenges that we're trying to address, whether they're Limited resources, water, nutrients, energy. Um, we have uh, conditions that are, that are continually we're dealing with, whether they're pests, diseases, disasters, and now we're seeing you know, uh, climate change, extreme events. But there's also challenges to innovation, the application, logistics, as well as the uh, one we always like to work on is funding. But what is the available, what is the technology that's out there? What are, you know, what is kind of the new thing that, that is uh, on the horizon or, or actually being um, developed? Well, in our, our human health system, our human health area, they now have cameras that can, you can actually swallow and uh, they can look inside you different, you know, find different things that are right or wrong. I, I don't know if that's good or bad. Uh, you can, uh, you, you, they can unlock your car from space now. Uh, <laughs> We've all gone through this one where you're going through the airport and, and they can see everything. Um, and then this one with, uh, you know, they can determine if you've washed your hands uh, because there's sensors that, that show uh, what you, what's actually been done. Uh, so that, you know, could be beneficial if you have a two or three year old and you tell them what to do and they don't always do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then here is the one for all you gamers out there that just, you know, uh, like to get in these. Now these games are getting real interactive and you can actually play, you know, across geographic locations. And, uh, but this is the kind of technology that probably is nothing new to a lot of you. And, and there's even other things going on. But I just thought um, this, um, this uh, a new biology for the 21st century, they point out that um, you know, computational sciences and engineers are part of this biological research that's going on, this, this emerging trend. And this is a quote from Bill Gates back in 2008 on the uh, special edition on robotics. And basically says, when or even if this industry, robotics, will achieve critical mass, if it does, it may well change the world. Well, we're six years later, and I think we're seeing some of those changes, uh, even in our cropping systems. 
Here's John Reed, uh, uh, Director of Production Technology at John Deere. And they're saying that uh, uh, opportunities to follow a different path to higher productivity, one that involves automation control and robotics. So you've seen their 48 row planter, but they're also looking at um, uh, very small individual uh, ro robots that move in the field. And, and, and that's an area that, that these companies are looking at as well. So what is the idea with this automation stuff? Well, if we've got weeds in our cropping system, we want to produce this, we want to support these people, but we also want to maintain our, our natural resources, our economics, but we don't necessarily want to revert to that. So how do we do all this? And, and can we you know, use automation to uh, help in this process? If we talk about integrated weed management, uh, a lot of treatment factors that, that contribute to the decisions that need to be made. And I'm not going to go into detail on these, but selection method, application amount, timing, plant conditions, environmental conditions, these are some of the, the factors that are considered in integrated weed management. And then you think about, well, if we're talking automation, we've got machine factors that include logistics, uh, if we're working in real time, uh, and then also guidance if you're talking about something that's, that's uh, autonomous. So targeted recognition and application systems actually are possible. And I'm going to show you some examples of research. If you look at the, the literature on, on engineering, they're really working in this uh, weed science area more than maybe some of the weed scientists. So they're kind of doing this work, and I think there's a real opportunity for um, overlap or collaboration uh, between these two fields. So if we talk about the spatial temporal identification and management of weeds, basically predicting uh, where the weeds are based on environmental factors, we're really good at predicting, not always, versus treatable based on location and plant characteristics. So I'm going to focus on this one uh, just in the, uh, in the, in the next uh, few minutes. So based on location. So locating the weeds, and, and there's some, uh, I think there's been work done, you know, where are weeds in the field? How do we find those? Do you, do you go through and, uh, you know, do it by hand? Do you, do you do it with uh, uh, sensors or, 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 or computers? Uh, but you can create these maps. And this is a comparison of maps created either um, by uh, manual weed mapping, so going out and mapping those by hand, uh, semi-automated uh, weed mapping, uh, kind of a hybrid between hand weeding or hand um, by hand versus um, using technology, and then on automated weed mapping. And you can see that um, they're, they're pretty close. There, there's some relationship there. And what they found was the uh, weed density, uh, in, in most cases, the difference was due to leaf occlusion. So when you've got overlapping weeds, it's, it's hard for the technology to identify well, this is a weed, and this is separate. It just looks at it as one weed. So that's part of the, the issue with why there's not a real nice um, relationship between those two. But if we, we talk about, loca so we know, OK, we look in the field, where are they? What about plant characteristics? Can we look at some of the characteristics of the plant to help us identify? Some of this, and this early work was back in the 1980s, uh, looking at um, uh, sunflowers and soybeans, and basically looking at uh, near infrared photography. But we've uh, obviously we've advanced uh, from that from that point on. In the early 1990s, they've developed these commercial spot sprayers, uh, basically looking at if there's green foliage or brown soil. So when the green comes up, that's you know an indication to spray. Um, but we're we're getting beyond that now. We're we're getting to where we've got some a knowledge-based machine vision system. And it's kind of based on, on these principles. You could you know, view this as a decision support um, tool. But uh, visually, you know, uh, finding where the plants are, and then through a series of steps, identifying those plants, 
and then even going to the species classification and population and then we can develop a weed map that's very specific and, and allows us to have a strategic approach. This right here is the hard part. You can find the plants, but getting to individual leaflets, looking at leaf shape, venation texture analysis, species classification, this is uh, the, the problem with this particular um, approach. So here's an example. This is um, from the Norwegian Crop Institute. Uh, and they tried to do some of this work, uh, looking at plant canopy that was um, uh, photographed uh, and, and doing this on the go as well. So this is not a stop, you know, view and then it's a, it's a real time uh, system because trying to get this to a, a practical application is, is going to require us to go at a certain speed. So we've got a knowledge based ma machine system and application system. Um, and this is again some the work by the, uh, the group at UC Davis. And basically this uh, schematic shows you that traveling in this direction with this uh, camera, um, image processing, a computer, and then connecting it to a microcontroller where, okay, we've identified the weeds. Now can we spray those based on the information that we collected uh, going through the field. And they've showed some success, uh, especially where they can distinguish tomato from nightshade and, and pigweed foliage. So it's very, right now it's, it's very rudimentary, um, but they're really making some uh, good, nice progress in that way. So here's another, um, uh, you know, looking at it, again, looking at the shape, but also now adding the visual color um, looking at, you know, what are the differences in the color of the plants? Can we use that to, to help us identify it? And most recently, um, this group uh, has been awarded a grant to look at um, doing kind of what they said here is, is, is modifying the color of that plant to then allow them to differentiate between the weeds and the plant. Now, what is this going to, what effect is that going to have on the production of the plant? I, I don't know. I, that's yet to be seen. But, but just, you know, changing this color, um, you know, using, in this case, a, 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 re a gene, that could be a way to help uh, kind of identify our, our desirable plants versus weeds. So, true integrated weed management, I think we have an opportunity to actually, you know, pursue this now, now that we have technology. So we have sensors that can locate individual weeds in the field. Weeds can be identified based on their characteristics or using a database. And then the uh, decision support system determines the best treatment. Now the, the part that is, uh, is important is, is, is we're working at the micro scale. And this is again a little bit of a conceptual um, challenge. And it's not for a field that's just loaded with weeds. That's not the intent. It's a, the intent is where you've, where you've got some weed management challenges and you can have a, a robotic system go through, identify where the weeds are. If there's a known herbicide resistant weed, that computer can identify it and apply a different treatment, whether it's a, you know, a cutting treatment, a burning treatment. But again, it has to be at the micro dose um, level. So, Advanced technology can account for spatial temporal variability. And since we have all tools on board, they're available at any time and any location in the field. So you're, you're bringing integrated weed management to the field. You're not waiting for different seasons. You're not rotating crops, not that you, that you shouldn't be doing that. But those tools are there in real time. So con conception to the field. These are some of the things. Um, this is a, a swarm technology right now. I don't know if some of you have heard about that. They have these individual kind of um, spider looking robots that, that kind of uh, move throughout the field and they have a, no, a little area that they, they manage. Um, there's also some of these automated um, machines that, that they're looking at where the weeds are and then they, they have actuators that, that move um, you know, within the row these are used in, in uh, row crops. Um, 
So the, you know, the question, are we still at research grade? I think we still are there. Uh, I know there's some startup companies in California that are actually uh, you know, working in this area and they're actually making some really uh, nice advances. But in general, I think we're still kind of uh, looking at, okay, how do we make this thing work and how do we do it efficiently? So I'm just gonna wrap up here with um, just some final thoughts. So I think, I think what was needed is kind of a merging of attitudes, not an emerging, but merging. And so what type of thinking do we need to have? And I don't really think it's conventional or sustainable. I think it's outside the box thinking. I think just a different approach and be thinking broadly. Uh, not like our second photograph where the young man was thinking, are you kidding me? This is not a new frontier. So, you know, I think our mindset needs to change about how do we view weeds? And so what do we need to be thinking about? Weeds are plants, you know. Some, and some happen to be very resilient, so what can we learn from those plants? Ma are managing weeds, when is it necessary for complete control as compared to when can we use thresholds? Is there a time when we, we can allow a weed or, or does it always have to be you know, annihilated? Advanced technology is part of our society. How can we enhance our tools in the uh, integrated weed management toolbox? I think some of those things are up and coming and there's either, uh, even other things that I didn't mention um, that, are, that are applicable. And we all know that weeds are ubiquitous, so what ecosystem services are some weeds providing and how can those services, not the weeds, be exploited? You know, so what can we, if, if they're here, we're dealing with them, are there some ways that we can actually incorporate them into our system in a way that doesn't become detrimental to our economics and our environment in other ways? So that's all I have. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. I think we have maybe a few minutes or so. That's a, that's a very good question. In fact, one of the things that I was, I was working on before I left uh, UNL was training livestock to eat invasive plants. So there's a person in Colorado, and maybe some of you are familiar, but she has trained uh, cows to eat weeds. Just Google it and you'll bring up her website. But in Nebraska, beef is like the number one commodity in, in, life, you know, in animal systems. So you've already got them out there. Why can't you just train them to eat the things that you don't want? And she showed that you could do that. Now I had some, there was, it was not as simple as it sounds, but I, I, that's a very, very good you know, idea, whether it's um, genetically modifying them or just training them to eat uh, these, these plants that we don't necessarily want? That, that's a very good question, and it's a good segue to my presentation that I will be giving uh, in a couple weeks to the Department of Natural Resources on invasive plants and ecology. So when I was at UNL, I had to basically balance agro agronomic weeds, invasive plants. So I, I kind of generalized for this audience, it's the agronomic side, but the invasive plants, you know, are very much, obviously, like you said, they're less intensively managed. So how do we address that? I just had a conversation with, um, with Carrie, the two Carries before I got in, like, where do we say, okay, you know, am I, am I making any difference here? May, am I making any progress on, especially at large scale? And I think that's where it really comes down to, um, defining what your goals are, especially when we talk to land managers, you know, is, is it a problem across your entire landscape? Do you have patches? Do you have satellite populations where you can, you know, focus on those? And I think that's where we're, we're really looking at removing those and, and, and it gets back to that restoration study by those, the, the folks that, you know, in, in frontiers and, but that's, that's a, a, maybe an equally as large or bigger question, but it's a good point. All right, well, time's up. So let's thank Steve once again. Good job, Steve. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.